Hello and welcome to the channel. I'm Christopher Rocchio, the author of The Sun Eater, science fantasy series and a seven-year veteran of the publishing industry. The Sun Eater is a space opera meets epic fantasy adventure set about 20,000 years in our future, in an age when mankind has conquered a huge swath of our galaxy. It is the story of a man called Hadrian Marlowe, written in his own words, a man who runs away from his home and his place as a nobleman in the great solemn galactic empire, only to find himself embroiled in the midst of a terrible war between said empire and the Sea Elsin, a marauding alien race bent on humanity's destruction. Hadrian tells us on page one that he is the man who ended that war and killed all of the Sea Elsin. His story is about why and how and about all the things no one else knows. James S. A. Corey of The Expanse called it science fiction at its most genuinely epic, a description I hope to live up to. If you have not read the books before and are just stumbling onto this channel, welcome. You can find links to my books in the description down below and I would be honored if you would check them out. But this video will be delving into spoiler territory, specifically for the fourth volume in the series, Kingdoms of Death. If you missed my recaps for the first three volumes of the series, Empire of Silence, Howling Dark, and Demon in White, you can find links for those in the description down below as well. And I will have set up a playlist here on the channel so you can listen to them all in sequence. I've been recording summary videos for each of my books to spare folks the need to reread if they so choose, and with the fifth volume, Ashes of Man, out in a couple weeks, it was time to prep this new recording. We will be getting into spoiler territory momentarily, so if you don't want to be spoiled on the first four books of the Sun Eater series, this is where we part ways. But for the rest of you, this is the story so far. For Hadrian Marlowe, it has been more than a century and a half since his victory over the Cielsen at the Battle of Berenique, when he revealed the powers granted him by the alien entity known as the Quiet to the Imperial Universe. He has taken his paramour, Velka Ondera, home to her people on the planet Ida, where they partially healed her from a computer virus that had affected the implants in her brain, though the experience left her damaged and prone to seizures. Afterwards, Hadrian's Red Company fought in many battles, notably the great battles of Senuesa and Sibaris. After Sibaris, Hadrian was arrested by the Inquisition of the Holy Terran Chantry and put on trial on the planet Thermon, which culminated in an attempt by the Chantry to assassinate Hadrian. Forced to step in, the Emperor shipped Hadrian to the planet Nessus, where he spent the next several decades as a guest-slash-prisoner to the Magnarch Carol Venantian, overlord of the outer reaches of the Empire nearest the Cielsen Front. When a Cielsen fleet attacks the fuel refinery on the nearby planet of Icana, Hadrian is called into action and defeats the Cielsen cyborg General Hushansa, forcing the enemy to retreat. A visit from the Solon Emperor sets Hadrian a new task and ends his imprisonment. Travel to the distant Lothrian Commonwealth and convince them to join the war against the Cielsen. Reluctantly, Hadrian goes, and on the Commonwealth's capital of Padmarak, discovers an oppressive totalitarian regime where the speech of every person is controlled down to the sentence level. Returning from a tour of the planet's facilities, Hadrian's convoy is attacked by rebels, and he escapes into the sewers of the great domed city of Vedatharad, where he encounters a trio of scavengers who live outside the totalizing authority of Lothrian rule. They nurse him back to health and reveal that there are no rebels, that the attack against him must have been orchestrated by the Lothrian government himself. Desperate to escape Padmarak, Hadrian reaches the Solon Imperial Embassy and plans to leave at once, but their departure is stymied, when the Imperial Ambassador to the Lothrian Commonwealth, Daemon Argyris, reveals himself to be in league with the enemy. Hadrian and his companions attempt to shoot their way out, but in the process, Hadrian is separated from his team and is unable to make it to their ship. He is brought before the Lothrian Grand Conclave, where it is revealed that one of their ministers is a cyborg sorcerer from Minos, an order of extrasolarians loyal to the Cielsen. What is more, the Lothrian Commonwealth has struck a deal with the Cielsen Prince Siriani Doriaica and hands Hadrian over to its right-hand man, Vati of the White Hand. Vati takes Hadrian prisoner and transports him to the Cielsen world ship of Daran Tun, the capital of Doriaica's dominion and its flagship. There, Hadrian meets Doriaica itself and endures seven years of interrogation and torture, during which Siriani Doriaica reveals the nature of the Cielsen relationship with the Watchers, cosmic beings they worship as gods, and the eternal enemy of the Quiet, the very being that brought Hadrian back from the dead in Howling Dark, granted him his powers in Demon White, and allegedly created the universe itself. The Watchers hope to use the Cielsen as their instruments to cut off the Quiet's future, thereby destroying creation itself. 
Moreover, they are not the first to try. Dorieka reveals to Hadrian the existence of the Anar, a race of crustacean-like creatures that ruled the galaxy a million years ago, and whose empire engaged in a program of annihilating life wherever they found it, desperate to sever the line of causality that linked the universe to the quiet. When they failed, they committed suicide, an entire empire gone in a night, leaving the galaxy desolate of life. What is more, Doriaka reveals that Hadrian's ship, the Tamerlane, and his entire red company were captured at the Lothrian capital of Padmarak, and serves Hadrian the head of his ship's navigator, Adric, as proof. The Mino sorcerer, Severine, offers Hadrian an escape from his torment, allow her to copy his consciousness to a computer so that she can clone him. If he will join Minos as a clone, that clone will live free with all his memories, if only he will aid her in understanding his quiet-derived powers. Hadrian refuses. He'd rather die than live such a cursed existence. After seven years on Darantun, the Sielsen arrive at their destination, the black planet of Yue. All the Sielsen clans have gathered there, save a few, for an Aitivani, a meeting of the great princes. Mockingly, Doriaika accords Hadrian the title of prince and invites him to participate, taking him into the meeting at the temple in the heart of Akterumu, the great city of Yue, a former Anar ruin treated by the Sielsen as their most sacred site. The temple resides within the massive skull at the center of Akterumu, its holy of holies inside the mighty cavity that once housed the creature's brain. This is the corpse of Mudinar, the dreamer, one of the very watchers the Sielsen worship as gods. There, Doriaika reveals its masterstroke. Relying upon a Minos-produced toxin, the Sielsen prophet murders all the other great princes gathered for the Aitivani, manufacturing a miracle to force the Sielsen armies gathered there to serve it as their king. Doriaika intends to cement this new rule by publicly executing Hadrian on the altar stone outside. By slaughtering the Quiet's champion, Siriani hopes to usher in a new age of darkness, an age of the Watcher's supremacy, and to set the universe on the path of dissolution, where entropy wins out and all life ceases. But that is not all. It reveals the wreck of the Tamerlane and has the mighty battleship lowered onto the plains of Akterumu. The Red Company is brought out for sacrifice. All 90,000 men are to be fed to the Sielsen army as proof of Siriani's power and goodwill as the new alien monarch. At Siriani's urging, Hadrian selects Lorian Aristides to return to the Imperium to tell humanity what has transpired there. He is ushered off by the Minoan sorcerers. The sacrifice begins with the Sielsen horde attacking the near defenseless humans. Chained to the altar stone, Hadrian can do nothing but watch as his people are brutalized. Siriani prepares to execute him when Hadrian receives a message in his armor's communication system. Valka is alive and opens fire from the wreck of the Tamerlane. It would seem that she, along with Octavia Corvo, Polino, and Krim, survived the chase on Padmarak, but were separated from the rest of the Red Company in the intervening years, but that they followed the Tamerlane and the Sielsen to Darantun, and from Darantun to Yue. The Tamerlane's artillery provides enough of a distraction for the Red Company to rally. Siriani tries to execute Hadrian anyway, but using his quantum-shifting abilities, Hadrian acquires a sword from an unused timeline and escapes his fetters, and successfully wounds Siriani in a duel. He fails to kill the great prince and is dragged away by his own people, who all fight to get him into a shuttle that will take him to the Tamerlane, crewed by Polino and Krim. They plan to escape using the Ascalon, a small warp-capable interceptor stored aboard the Tamerlane. It can only take perhaps a hundred people of the ninety thousand, but it is the only option they have, and his people, believing in Hadrian's power, die trying to save him. The shuttle is attacked by the Sielsen general Aulam. Ilara, Krim, and Ilex are killed in the battle, leaving Hadrian and Polino to battle Aulam alone on the hull of the grounded Tamerlane. Polino dies killing the powerful cyborg, and Hadrian reaches the Ascalon alone, only to find Corvo has not joined them. She has remained on the Tamerlane's bridge to cover his and Valka's escape. Only Hadrian and Valka win free. Two survivors in 90,000. It is a crushing loss. Bottled up on the barely functioning Ascalon, Hadrian and Valka are given a difficult choice. One of them must enter Fugue for the duration of their journey to the planet Colchis, while the other must spend decades alone, watching the ship. After a few months of recovery together, Hadrian volunteers to undertake the task, and lets Valka sleep for the long journey. 
On Colchis, they find the descendants of Siran, Hadrian's now long-dead friend, who reveals that they have been caring for Hadrian's father, who has been sleeping in cryonic fugue on the remote island of Thessa now for decades. Taking him there at once, the mysterious father is revealed to be none other than Tor Gibson, though how he paid for the cryonics lab and arranged this whole thing is a mystery. Hadrian and Velka spend several years on the island with the elderly Gibson, who eventually succumbs to the passage of time and dies of old age. Hadrian builds a cairn for the old man, and the book ends with him watching the sun go down over the waters. Thus ends Book Four, Kingdoms of Death. <laughs>